The summer evening in Toulouse was unusually quiet. The sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving the streets bathed in a soft golden twilight. In a modest apartment building on Rue du Tour, one door remained closed and silent, a door that had always been a portal to life and laughter. Behind that door lived Eva Bourseau, a vibrant 23-year-old art history student known for her boundless energy and constant presence on social media. But tonight, her apartment was eerily still. Eva's phone, usually a flurry of activity, now sat abandoned on her bed, buzzing intermittently with unanswered messages. The screen, once lighting up with notifications from friends, had dimmed, echoing the silence that had taken hold of her once lively space. As the days passed, this silence grew louder. Eva, who could usually be counted on for a quick reply or a spontaneous Instagram post, had gone dark. Her social media accounts, typically filled with snapshots of her life, photos of art exhibits, coffee dates with friends, and late-night study sessions, were now frozen in time, the last post a distant memory. Friends began to notice her absence. At first, they assumed she was busy, perhaps engrossed in her studies, but as their messages remained unanswered, concern began to gnaw at them. Camille, her closest friend, tried calling, first casually, then with increasing urgency, still nothing. Eva's mother, living miles away, felt a growing sense of unease with each passing day, her daughter's uncharacteristic silence weighing heavily on her heart. Si Eva Bourseau was the kind of person who could always be counted on for a quick reply. Whether it was a text, a comment on social media, or a spontaneous post, she was always connected. Her friends knew her as someone who lived a vibrant life, filled with the energy of a young woman balancing her studies in art history with a bustling social life. Eva's social media presence was a reflection of this. Her accounts were filled with snapshots of art exhibits, late-night study sessions, and candid moments with friends. So when Eva suddenly went silent, her friends noticed right away. It wasn't just the absence of posts that alarmed them, it was the complete lack of communication. At first, they thought she might be taking a break, perhaps a few days to focus on her studies or some time away from the constant buzz of notifications. But as the hours turned into days, concern began to grow. Camille, her best friend since childhood, was the first to feel that something was wrong. She had texted Eva several times, each message going unanswered. She called too, but each call went straight to voicemail. Camille tried to reassure herself. Eva was probably busy, she thought maybe wrapped up in a project or dealing with something personal. But a nagging worry began to settle in the pit of her stomach. She reached out to their mutual friends, asking if anyone had heard from Eva. The answer was the same each time, nothing. The silence was deafening. Even those who were not particularly close to Eva began to feel uneasy. Her social media, which had always been so active, was completely still. No new posts, no comments, not even a like. The last time anyone had seen Eva was a few days earlier. She had invited a small group of friends over to her apartment to watch documentaries about drugs, a topic that fascinated her in a detached, academic way. They had spent the night discussing the films, debating the societal impacts, and sharing thoughts on the complexities of addiction and the underground drug trade. It was just like any other evening. As the night wore on and the sky began to lighten, Eva grew tired. Around 6 a.m., she had politely asked her friends to leave, needing some time to herself to wind down and rest. There had been no indication that anything was wrong, nothing out of the ordinary in her demeanor. It was just another night in Toulouse. But now that ordinary night seemed to hold a darker significance. Camille couldn't shake the feeling that something had happened after they left. She replayed their last conversation in her head, looking for any signs she might have missed. There were none. The unease grew stronger with each passing hour. As the days went by, Camille's concern turned into something closer to panic. She had always known Ava to be reliable, and this extended silence was entirely out of character. Camille decided to take action. If Ava wasn't answering her phone or responding to messages, then she would have to check on her in person. Camille wasn't the only one who had this idea. Thomas, a neighbor who lived in the same building as Eva, had also noticed her unusual absence. They were friendly in the way neighbors often are, exchanging pleasantries in the hallway, occasionally sharing a quick chat about the weather or the latest news in the building. Thomas had seen Eva the morning she asked her friends to leave. 
He had run into her in the hallway, and they had exchanged a brief hello. She seemed tired, but otherwise fine. Since then, however, he hadn't seen her at all. Normally, he would catch a glimpse of her on her way out, or hear her moving around in her apartment. But the past few days had been eerily quiet. Concerned, Thomas decided to knock on Eva's door. It was mid-afternoon, and the building was mostly empty, with the other residents at work or school. He knocked several times, listening for any sound of movement inside. But there was nothing. The door remained closed, and the apartment was silent. After a few minutes, Thomas hesitated. Maybe she was out, he thought, or maybe she just didn't want to be disturbed. He decided to leave, telling himself that he was overreacting. But as he walked back to his own apartment, a sense of unease settled over him. He would later regret not doing more. I Meanwhile, Ava's mother had been trying to reach her daughter as well. They spoke regularly, and Ava always made time for a quick chat or text. When she hadn't heard from Eva in days, her worry turned into something more tangible. Eva's mother knew her daughter well enough to understand that this silence wasn't voluntary. Something was wrong. Unable to shake the feeling that something terrible had happened, she decided to make the trip to Toulouse. The journey was filled with dread, each passing kilometer amplifying her fear. She tried calling again and again, but there was no answer. The thought of arriving at her daughter's door and finding her safe and sound was the only thing keeping her going. Eva's mother arrived at the apartment building in the early afternoon. The sun was shining and the streets were filled with the sounds of summer, children playing, people chatting, cars passing by. But all of this seemed distant, muffled by the pounding of her heart. She approached the door to Eva's apartment, hoping against hope that she would hear her daughter's voice from inside. But as she reached the door, a wave of nausea washed over her. The smell was overpowering, an acrid, foul odor that seeped through the cracks of the door and hung in the air like a dark cloud. Her hand trembled as she knocked, calling out Eva's name. There was no answer. Panicking, she ran to Thomas's door and banged on it. He answered quickly, surprised to see Eva's mother standing there, her face pale with fear. She explained the situation, and Thomas immediately understood. He had noticed the smell too, but he hadn't connected it to anything serious until now. They decided to call the fire department to open the door and get inside. The firefighters arrived within minutes. The smell hit them as soon as they entered the building, confirming that this was no ordinary welfare check. They forced the door open, and what they found inside was beyond anything they had expected. The stench was unbearable, filling every corner of the small apartment. As they moved through the room, they reached the bathroom, where a large plastic barrel stood ominously in the center. One of the firefighters approached it, his face grim, and peered inside. What he saw made him recoil in horror. Inside the barrel were the remains of Eva Borso, her body partially dissolved in acid. The gruesome scene was something out of a nightmare. The apartment was now a crime scene. The discovery of Eva Borso's body sent shockwaves through the quiet neighborhood of Toulouse. The police arrived swiftly, sealing off the apartment complex with yellow crime scene tape. Eva's mother stood outside, her heart shattered, as the realization of what had happened to her daughter began to sink in. The silence that had begun as a simple absence had now revealed its terrible secret. Eva was gone, and the world she had left behind would never be the same. The gruesome nature of the crime was immediately apparent, and it was clear that this was not just a tragic accident or an unexplained death. This was a homicide. The forensic team, clad in white suits and gloves, meticulously combed through Eva's apartment. The bathroom, where the large plastic barrel containing her remains was found, was the primary focus. The acid had done its horrific work, but there were still traces left behind, small, chilling pieces of evidence that would later help piece together the final moments of Eva's life. Every object, every surface was examined for fingerprints, blood traces, and any other signs of what might have transpired in those terrible final hours. Nah. Meanwhile, outside the apartment, the neighborhood had transformed from a peaceful residential area into a scene of chaos. News of the discovery had spread like wildfire, and soon the street was swarming with journalists, photographers, and onlookers. The media quickly latched onto the story, sensationalizing every gruesome detail. Headlines screamed of the Breaking Bad-style murder, and within hours, Eva's face was plastered across television screens and newspapers nationwide. Reporters hounded anyone who might have known her, eager for any scrap of information that could add to the drama. 
the quiet, unassuming building had become the epicenter of a national tragedy. Eva's friends and neighbors, who had once been the most familiar with her vibrant presence, now found themselves grappling with the horrifying reality of her death. The police began the painstaking task of interviewing everyone who might have had contact with Eva in the days leading up to her disappearance. Neighbors, like Thomas, were among the first to be questioned. Thomas, still reeling from the discovery, recounted everything he could remember the last time he saw Eva, the increasingly foul odor that had emanated from her apartment, and his regret at not acting sooner. He described the strange, unsettling silence that had fallen over the building and the faint sounds he had heard, footsteps, a creaking floor, coming from her apartment, even after she had gone quiet. Other neighbors spoke of seeing unfamiliar faces coming and going from Eva's apartment in the weeks before her disappearance. Some mentioned the late-night gatherings, the small groups of people who would arrive quietly and leave just as discreetly. These details began to paint a picture of a life that was far more complex than anyone had realized. As the investigation progressed, detectives aimed to uncover any clues that might explain how she had ended up in such a horrifying situation. On the surface, Eva seemed like an ordinary young woman, a dedicated student, a beloved daughter, a loyal friend. But as they dug deeper, the detectives began to uncover a darker side to her life, one that had been hidden from most of those who knew her. Eva's phone and laptop were crucial pieces of evidence. Forensic analysis of her devices revealed a network of contacts that extended far beyond her university and social circles. There were encrypted messages, late-night communications with individuals who were clearly involved in the drug trade. The more the detectives uncovered, the more it became clear that Ava had been leading a double life, one that involved not just casual drug use, but active participation in dealing. The discovery of Ava's involvement in drug dealing added a new layer of complexity to the case. It also provided a possible motive for her murder. Had she crossed someone in the drug world? Was her death the result of a deal gone wrong? These were the questions that now guided the investigation. The detectives knew they needed to focus on the individuals who had been closest to her in recent weeks, those who might have had both the opportunity and the motive to harm her. The names Zakaria Banuini and Taha Alawi quickly rose to the top of the list. Both weren't known to the local police, but their recent connection to Eva, coupled with the growing suspicion that her death was drug-related, made them prime suspects. Camille, Eva's close friend still in shock from the news, struggled to reconcile the Eva she knew with the revelations that were coming to light. She spoke of the Eva who loved art, who dreamed of traveling the world, and who had never seemed like someone who would get involved in something as dangerous as drug dealing. Others, however, hinted at a different side of Eva. Some had noticed changes in her behavior in the months leading up to her death, late nights, secretive phone calls, a certain edginess that hadn't been there before. They spoke of her growing closeness with Zachariah and Taha, two young men who had recently become fixtures in her life. Zachariah, a tall and imposing figure, was known for his charm, but also for his temper. He had a way of making people feel at ease, but there was an underlying tension about him, a volatility that made those who knew him wary. Taha, by contrast, was quieter, more reserved, but with a darkness that seemed to linger beneath the surface. The two of them together made an odd pair, but they were inseparable, and for reasons that no one fully understood. Eva had become entangled in their world. The detectives knew they were onto something, but they needed more than just suspicion. They needed hard evidence. They combed through phone records, tracking the calls and messages between Eva, Zakaria, and Taha in the days leading up to her death. What they found was a series of increasingly tense exchanges, messages filled with urgency and, in some cases, barely veiled threats. It became clear that Zakaria and Taha were under significant pressure, possibly owing money to more dangerous figures in the drug trade. Eva, who had started out as a friend, had somehow become entangled in their problems. The detective speculated that her murder might have been an act of desperation, a way for Zakaria and Taha to solve their problems by taking whatever money and drugs she had and silencing her permanently. The inconsistencies in Zakaria and Taha's stories only fueled the suspicions. During their initial interviews, both had been cooperative but vague, their accounts of the night in question filled with gaps and contradictions, 
When pressed, they became defensive, a sure sign to the investigators that there was more to their involvement than they were letting on. As the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place, the detectives knew it was only a matter of time before Zachariah and Taha slipped up, or someone with knowledge of what happened came forward. The investigation was closing in, and the truth, as horrifying as it was, would soon be revealed. It had been a long, unsettling night. Zachariah and Taha left the apartment into the early morning light, but as they walked away, Taha's anxiety began to surface. He had a debt that had been growing as his involvement in the drug trade deepened. The thought gnawed at him, twisting his stomach into knots. They needed to settle things now, he insisted. Zachariah, equally unnerved by their precarious situation, agreed. The two turned back, their decision taking shape quickly in their minds. They would return to Eva's apartment, confront her, and take whatever she had, money, drugs, anything that could buy them more time in their dangerous world. As they approached her door again, they fabricated an excuse for re-entering, claiming they had forgotten something inside. Eva, unaware of the growing menace, opened the door. Zachariah was the first to step inside, his large frame casting a shadow over Eva's slight figure. Hidden in his hand was a pair of brass knuckles, a weapon he had brought out of desperation and fear. When Eva saw the glint of metal, she understood instantly that this was not a friendly return. Panic surged through her and she started to scream, her instincts driving her to flee. But Zachariah was quicker. With a single brutal motion he struck her across the face, the brass knuckles connecting with a sickening thud. Eva stumbled, trying to escape, but Zachariah was relentless. He chased her down, landing blow after blow until she collapsed on the floor, bleeding and terrified. As Eva lay on the ground, her vision blurring, Taha demanded to know where she kept her money and drugs. Through her pain, Eva managed to direct them to a small box near her sofa bed. Zachariah, his heart pounding and hands trembling, watched as Taha rifled through her belongings, searching for anything of value. But the violence didn't stop there. As Taha's frustration grew, he lashed out again and again, using a crowbar he had found in the apartment. Eva's pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears as Taha, in a frenzy of fear and rage, delivered the final fatal blows. When Zachariah finally realized that Eva was no longer breathing, the reality of what they had done hit him like a ton of bricks. The room fell silent the only sound the ragged breathing of the two young men who now stood over Eva's lifeless body. What had started as a desperate attempt to settle a debt had spiraled into something far darker, a brutal, senseless murder. The initial shock of what they had done left Zachariah and Taha paralyzed with fear, but soon panic set in. They had crossed a line and there was no going back. They needed to cover their tracks to erase any evidence of their involvement. The image of the TV show, Breaking Bad, flashed through their minds. If it had worked on screen, perhaps it could work in real life. No. Three hours after the murder, they returned to Eva's apartment. This time, they came armed not with weapons, but with 15 liters of acid, a grim solution to their problem. They knew they had to dispose of the body, and in their frenzied state, dissolving it seemed like the only option. The acid was poured into the large plastic barrel they had found in the bathroom, and they placed Eva's body inside hoping it would dissolve away any evidence of their crime. The next day, driven by fear and desperation, they returned once more, this time with a large plastic trunk. Their plan was simple, yet horrifying, to transfer whatever remained of Eva's body into the trunk and dispose of it, far from Toulouse. But as the hours passed, it became clear that their plan was not working, as they had hoped. The acid was not as effective as they had seen in the show, and the remains were not dissolving as they had expected. Instead, a putrid smell began to fill the apartment, a smell that would soon alert the entire building to the horror within. With each visit to the apartment, Zachariah and Taha grew more paranoid. They became increasingly aware of the risks they were taking by returning to the scene of the crime. Every footstep in the hallway, every creak of the floorboards sent their hearts racing. They began to distrust each other, the bond between them fraying under the pressure of what they had done. The once unbreakable partnership now seemed fragile, each of them suspecting that the other might crack under the strain. As the days passed, the weight of their crime became unbearable. Zachariah, once the more composed of the two, found himself spiraling into guilt and fear, 
The smell from Eva's apartment had grown stronger, and he knew it was only a matter of time before someone discovered the truth. His mind raced with thoughts of what would happen if they were caught. The fear gnawed at him, making it impossible to sleep, to eat, to think clearly. Taha, too, was unraveling. The once confident and collected young man was now a shadow of himself, haunted by the images of what they had done. His temper grew shorter, his paranoia more pronounced. He began to see threats everywhere, in the faces of neighbors, in the whispers of strangers, in the silence of the night. The trust between him and Zachariah disintegrated, replaced by suspicion and fear. They started to avoid each other, each one fearing that the other might betray them to save himself. The breaking point came when Zachariah, unable to bear the guilt any longer, confided in his girlfriend. He told her everything, the murder, the acid, the failed cover-up. She was horrified, but she knew what had to be done. Together they made the decision to go to the police. On a bleak afternoon, Zachariah Bonuini, accompanied by his girlfriend, walked into the police station. His hands shook, his face pale with fear and remorse. He could barely look the officers in the eye as he began to speak, his voice barely above a whisper. He confessed to everything, the murder, the cover-up, the desperate attempts to hide their crime. The words tumbled out, each one, a weight lifted from his conscience, but a new burden placed on his future. Both men were charged with the murder of Ava Borso and the attempted concealment of her body. The confession allowed the police to reconstruct the events of that fateful night, painting a chilling picture of a crime driven by an utter lack of humanity. The investigation, which had begun with a horrifying discovery, now had its answers. But for those who knew and loved Eva, the knowledge of how she had died only deepened the tragedy. The dark truth had emerged, leaving in its wake a trail of sorrow and shattered lives. The trial of Zakaria Banuini and Taha Alawi began amid a storm of media attention. The brutal nature of Eva Borso's murder, combined with the macabre details of the attempted cover-up, had captured the nation's attention. The courtroom was packed with journalists, legal experts, and members of the public, all eager to witness the proceedings. The case had become a focal point in a broader discussion about youth, violence, and the dark influence of popular culture. Zachariah and Taha were both charged with murder and the attempted concealment of Eva's body. The charges were severe, reflecting the premeditated nature of their actions and the utter disregard they had shown for Ava's life. From the outset, the prosecution made it clear that they intended to seek the maximum penalties allowed by law. The prosecution's case was strong, built on the foundation of Zachariah's confession and the overwhelming forensic evidence. The prosecution outlined the events of that night in painstaking detail, describing how the two men had returned to Eva's apartment with the intention of robbing her, and how that plan had quickly escalated into a vicious, cold-blooded murder. They presented the brass knuckles, the crowbar, and the acid as evidence, each item a chilling reminder of the brutality that had been inflicted on Eva. In contrast, the defense faced an uphill battle. Their primary strategy was to mitigate the culpability of their clients by emphasizing the influence of drugs and the desperation that had driven them to commit the crime. Zachariah's lawyer argued that his client had not intended to kill Eva, but that the situation had spiraled out of control due to the effects of drugs and fear. They portrayed Zachariah as a young man who had made a series of terrible decisions under immense pressure, rather than as a cold-blooded killer. Taha's defense was similar, focusing on his role as a follower rather than a leader in the crime. His lawyer attempted to distance Taha from the most violent aspects of the crime, arguing that it was Zachariah who had inflicted the fatal blows, while Taha had been caught up in the moment, driven by fear and panic. They sought to paint a picture of Taha as a young man who had been influenced by stronger personalities and had participated in the crime, out of desperation rather than malice. The courtroom drama reached its peak during the testimonies. Zachariah, who had confessed to the crime, took the stand. His demeanor was one of regret and fear, but also of someone who had accepted his fate. He recounted the events of that night, his voice trembling as he spoke of the moment when he realized Eva was dead. The courtroom was silent as he described the horror of what they had done, the futile attempt to dissolve her body, and the overwhelming guilt that had driven him to confess. Taha, however, was more defiant. His testimony was marked by a mixture of denial and blame-shifting. 
he minimized his role in the violence, placing the blame squarely on Zachariah's shoulders. But the prosecution was relentless, cross-examining him with precision and pointing out the inconsistencies in his story. The evidence against him was damning, and it was clear to everyone in the courtroom that both men were equally responsible for the murder. After weeks of testimony, arguments, and emotional displays, the trial finally came to an end. The jury deliberated for several days, weighing the evidence and the arguments presented by both sides. When they returned to the courtroom, the atmosphere was tense, charged with the anticipation of the verdict. The jury found both Zakaria Banuini and Taha Alawi guilty of murder and attempted body concealment. Zakaria, as the primary assailant, received the harshest sentence, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The judge emphasized the brutality of the crime and the lack of remorse shown during the act. Taha, while also found guilty, received a slightly lesser sentence, 25 years in prison, reflecting his secondary role in the physical assault, but acknowledging his full participation in the crime and cover-up. The aftermath of the trial was felt far beyond the courtroom. The media, which had followed the case closely, now turned its attention to the broader implications of the crime. Commentators and experts debated the influence of violent media on young minds, particularly the role that the TV show Breaking Bad had played in inspiring the gruesome attempt to dissolve Eva's body. The case became a flashpoint in a national conversation about the effects of media violence and the responsibilities of creators to consider the potential impact of their work. Some argued that the show's depiction of crime had glamorized the idea of cleaning up after a murder, leading impressionable viewers like Zachariah and Taha to believe that they could replicate these actions in real life. Others countered that it was not the media's responsibility to police its content, and that the real issue lay in the individuals who committed the crime and the circumstances that led them to such a desperate place. In Toulouse, the community was left reeling. Ava's death had shattered the sense of security in the neighborhood, leaving residents struggling to comprehend how such a tragedy could have occurred in their midst. Her friends and family were devastated, grappling with the loss of a young woman who had been full of life and promise. For Ava's mother, the grief was all-consuming. She could not escape the haunting images of her daughter's final moments, nor the pain of knowing that Ava had suffered so horribly before her death. The story of Ava Bourseau's life and death is a cautionary tale about the consequences of the choices we make. It is a story about how a series of small, seemingly insignificant decisions can spiral into something far darker and more devastating than anyone could have imagined. It is about the dangers of living a double life, of becoming entangled in a world that is beyond your control, and the ultimate betrayal that can come from those you trust the most. In the months following the trial, Camille, Eva's best friend, made a final visit to Eva's grave. The air was crisp, and the autumn leaves had begun to fall, covering the ground in a blanket of red and gold. Camille stood silently by the headstone, the weight of loss pressing down on her. She placed a small bouquet of flowers on the grave, the colors vibrant against the gray stone. For Eva's mother, the grief was a constant companion. She found solace in the work of the foundation they had created in Eva's name, but the ache of loss remained. She often visited Eva's grave, finding a quiet peace in the moments she spent there, speaking to her daughter in the silence, remembering the love that would never fade. 